I'd like to welcome you to our module on racial and ethnic inequality. In the US case, racial and ethnic inequality play an especially central role in our stratification system, which is why we've secured some of the most talented scholars for this module. Because this module is our last, our comments here will serve two purposes. As always, we'll discuss the videos in this particular module, but we'll also take a step back and reflect on the course as a whole. We'll do so by comparing three key types of inequality class inequality, gender inequality, and racial inequality. And we'll show how these types of inequality are similar to and different from one another. I'm gonna turn it over to David now to discuss the first point of difference between these types of inequality. I'll lead off by discussing the role of segregation in supporting each of these three types. Let me start by noting that there isn't all that much gender segregation. To be sure, there's lots of gender inequality, but there's not that much gender segregation. Why not? Because the family is a deeply integrative institution, an institution that brings males and females together. I don't, of course, mean to suggest that we run a perfectly gender-integrated society. Far from it. After all, when we leave the safety of the family, we start to segregate pretty decisively by gender. We have separate bathrooms, women's colleges, and, of course, gender-dominated occupations. But the family brings women and men back together and moderates the total amount of segregation in the society as a whole. With race, it's a very different matter. Although most families include both males and females, they don't typically include members of different races. If your family members are the same race as you, and if you're spending much of your time in your own family, then you're not gonna be interacting all that much outside your race. And just like that, we're running a high segregation society. But it gets worse. It's not just that families aren't generating all that much in the way of integration. In addition, there are two other institutions, neighborhoods and prisons that are even more deeply segregated by race. I won't talk in detail about these institutions because we have so many videos addressing them. We have Doug Massey describing how our neighborhoods came to be so racially segregated. We have Bill Wilson describing the effects of living in these segregated neighborhoods. And we have Becky Pettit and Diva Pager describing the effects of siphoning off the poorest blacks and warehousing them in our prisons. The upshot is that we live in a world that's deeply segregated by race with families, neighborhoods, and prisons all working in concert to deliver that outcome. I want to issue a bit of a corrective. It's not all doom and gloom. David neglected to mention that some cities are gradually becoming less segregated by race, a result that Doug Massey will discuss in his contribution. This trend is of course partly countered by the rise of gated communities and increasingly extreme economic segregation. Spatial segregation is increasingly rooted in how much money you make rather than your racial or ethnic background. That's an important development, but that's not all. David also neglected to mention the ongoing increase in racial and ethnic intermarriage. Although the increase is most prominent among non-black groups, there's also a slight increase in white-black marriages. It follows that families are slowly becoming a zone of real racial and ethnic mixing, just like they're already a quite profound zone of gender mixing. This development especially matters because the children coming out of mixed race families may have complicated identities that cut across and blur traditional racial lines. The daughter of white and Asian parents, for example, may identify with both groups and in effect form a bridge between them. We don't get the same type of second generation blending in the case of gender. The child of mixed gender parents typically identifies as either male or female, whereas mixed race parenting can often lead to complicated hybrid identities for children, mixed gender parenting rarely does. Put differently, mixed race parenting works to break down categorical inequality, whereas mixed gender parenting serves only to reproduce it. And this in turn means that racial and ethnic intermarriage, at least in principle, is a special force for change. The larger point here is that the mantra that race is socially constructed isn't just liberal dogma, it's very real indeed. As more children are born into mixed race families, an extra dose of constructive work becomes necessary. The children in these families have to figure out the group with which they'll identify. It follows that there's more mobility between racial categories than many people think. And furthermore, mixed marriages are not the only source of mobility. In one of our videos, Aaliyah Saperstein shows that even the most subtle of cues, like how a person dresses, can affect the race that we attribute to him or her. Put simply, if you dress in a suit or look well off, you're more likely to be seen as white. 
It's also, of course, a mistake to view gender as fixed. As we all know, individuals can change their gender, and they're doing so more now than ever before. I don't mean to overstate the amount of race and gender mobility. Although there's mobility across all three types of inequality, race, gender, and class, it's clear that by far and away, there's more class mobility than any other type. It's also, I might add, a very influential form of mobility. As Saperstein shows, if your class situation improves, it's going to affect how others see your race. This takes us to the last category across which comparisons might be made. I'm referring now to group mobility. In some circumstances, the social standing of a group as a whole can change, meaning that all members of that group come to enjoy more or less power, status, or money. This type of mobility is rare, but it does happen from time to time. The gender revolution, for example, is all about women coming to enjoy increased power, status, and money relative to men. In this module, we're focused on the mobility of racial and ethnic groups. And the key question here is why have some racial and ethnic groups experienced rapid upward mobility while others have not? Why are some groups, like Asian Americans, considered model minorities and experiencing rapid upward mobility? Why are other groups, like Mexican Americans, experiencing a somewhat slower mobility trajectory? The last two presenters in this course, Tomas Jimenez and Alejandro Portez, take on just this type of group mobility question. And the answers are compelling, but we won't give them away. We're going to have to call this to a close. I hope we've provided everyone with a roadmap of sorts to the videos that follow. As this is our last module, I'd like to take this opportunity to say it's been a real pleasure, a real pleasure to present this very important material to you. One last point, if you want to learn more, come check out our site, inequality.com. That's it. Good luck and happy viewing.